thank you everyone for joining me on this episode of Brown Girl Green. I am so excited to have Kelly on our show today. Kelly from Ecos, as she is called on the gram. I am so excited to have you on the show today. I would love if you could introduce yourself and what brings you to sustainability today. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show, first of all. I absolutely love the work you do, and I'm so thrilled to be here on the show today. So yes, I'm president and CEO of Ecos. We make plant-powered cleaning products. We are the only woman-owned, black-owned, nationally distributed green cleaning brand in the nation. And I'm super proud of the work that we do here with the Ecos team. We have four manufacturing facilities. I'm located here in California at our corporate headquarters, but we're also in Illinois, we're in Washington, we're in New Jersey, and all of our facilities are carbon neutral, they're water neutral, they're platinum zero waste. So it's a combination of green chemistry to make sure that the consumer has the greenest product to protect their health alongside of sustainable manufacturing to make sure that we're taking care of our beautiful shared planet. That's amazing. Can you tell us more about how Ecos is becoming a climate positive company? And, you know, a lot of the stuff that you all put out is that you do things like thinking about carbon neutrality, water neutrality, and also building, you know, a platinum zero waste certification. Can you talk a little bit more about what that journey has looked like? Absolutely. You know, I've always had a deep and abiding belief that authenticity is critically important for a brand, walking the talk, doing what you say you're going to do. And since 1967, our company has been committed to green chemistry and the importance of removing toxins from cleaning products. But shortly after my father passed away and I took over as CEO and president of the company, I wanted to make sure that our manufacturing practices matched our green chemistry. And so we embarked upon a journey to become climate positive. And in 2021, we became the first climate positive manufacturer in the nation. Now that journey started with putting together an amazing team. I was fortunate enough to meet our Vice President of Sustainability back in 2008, and she took over the sustainability initiatives in 2010. And an amazing woman with a PhD in life cycle analysis and in education, and was so deeply committed to our sustainability goals. I would show up at work and she would be in the trash can with a plastic water bottle saying, who did this? And walking around the facility to see who did it, right? And so that was how we went about it. So 2013, we became carbon neutral. First it was, how do we minimize our impact on the planet? So first it was, how do we get to neutral? So we became carbon neutral. In 2015, we achieved the Platinum Zero Waste Certification. Now for your audience, I'm sure they know how hard it is to get to zero waste in their homes. So just yeah. imagine, we're manufacturing for the world's largest retailers. You can buy Ecos at Walmart, at Sam's, at yeah. Costco. And so we've got you know hundreds of employees in our facilities working so yeah. hard to create our products. And it really took the buy-in of everyone. Everyone had to understand that every action that every person took every day was so meaningful, not only yeah. to our sustainability goals, but to our planet. And so really everyone had to make different decisions. How could you reuse the item? How could you rethink the item? Mm -hmm. And, you know, by 2015, we were able to divert more than 95% of our waste from the landfill. Mm -hmm. And as I sit here today in 23, we're at 99.8%. Wow. And so that just makes me so proud of our entire team at Ecos because, you know, they're really rethinking everything. And then after waste, we went to tackle water because water is something, living here in California, we're facing droughts all of the time. There's all sorts of water insecurity across yeah. the globe. And so it's such a precious natural resource. And so then it became, how do we look at water and how do we reduce the amount of water we're using? We yeah. started doing things like, you know, our liquidless laundry detergent, our liquidless auto dishwashing detergent. And that initiative not only removed water from the product, it removed 
of plastic. And so we could have a product that was also plastic free. All of those things were important. And then in 21, getting to climate positive meant, okay, we've done everything we can to minimize our impact, but we have to do more. Sustainability is no longer enough. We, you know, businesses haven't acted quick enough. Individuals haven't acted mm -hmm. quick enough. So now it's about how do we give back? So, you know, minimize impact and then work on replenishing our wetlands, work on contributing to different restoration projects around the globe. And so that was how we got to being 110% climate positive. But I would tell you, it takes the collective effort of everyone who walks through this front door. Wow. We have to really work in harmony. You have to have the buy-in of every team member. It's not just about like, you have to do this because this is our sustainability goal. It's yeah. about the why. Why do we do this? Why is it important? Why is it important to your children, to your family? This is so critically important. And that's one of the things that's oftentimes disheartening is that people think of the planet as something they're disconnected from, yet it affects their very own health and it affects the health of every one they love. So getting that kind of passion throughout our entire company was certainly critical to achieving those sustainability goals. You know, what I really like about Ecos, along with, you know, meeting those goals is that like, you're not super expensive, like you're actually like an affordable brand. And I find that really fascinating, because I hear a lot of companies who are like, oh, we want to meet the sustainability goals, but like it's very expensive and like that cost is going to fall on the consumer. How have you all been able to like mitigate that to still make it cost competitive? Thank you for that question. You know, we believe wholeheartedly that everyone has the right to a healthy home. This is a fundamental right. And if you produce products that are produced at a premium, that are too expensive, then you deny a lot of people access to products yeah. that are safe. And it's not that people don't want safe products for their homes, they oftentimes can't afford it. Yeah. And if someone is standing in a store and they suddenly have to pay more for a green product, they're oftentimes in the position that they have to buy a conventional brand. And so yeah. the way in which we've kept our costs low is number one, we make everything ourselves. Mm. So we're not a marketing agency. Agency. We don't use third-party co-packers. If you mm. come to Ecos, you'll see today on Saturday, our production lines are running. We control the entire production process. And that's important because mm. most green companies are marketing companies. They've got the branding, they've got the initiative, but they have no control over the product that's being made. Now there's two reasons to control the product that's being made. Number one, you reduce cost by taking out a middleman. But number two, you also control quality. So you feel really confident when you say, hey, these are the greenest ingredients, this is how it's made. I know that's true because we do it ourselves. And then when we work with our retail partners, we wanna make sure that we're putting enough margin to be healthy, but not huge premiums on these mm -hmm. products. The idea that people should pay up, it's gotta end. You know, I look forward to the day that you and I are talking on your show about how all products are just green. It's no longer mm -hmm. green cleaning products, it's just cleaning products. Yeah. Because people have a profound understanding that cleaning products a part of their wellness journey that mm -hmm. you can't think about clean and healthy food if you're not thinking about the plates mm -hmm. you're eating them off of the glasses you're mm -hmm. drinking off of the air you're breathing but that's how we keep costs down making it ourselves selling it directly to the retailer making sure that the markups aren't high mm -hmm. making sure that executives in the company don't have big salaries you know we have wage compaction here so you don't have people on top making huge multiples of people mm -hmm. that are working in other roles and all of those things allow us to get a product out to the market at an affordable price point so that no matter where you shop you should be able to purchase our products and oftentimes for much less than yeah. the conventional counterparts on shelf. No, that's very interesting. Thank you for including all of that background on it. And you know, something else that I find really interesting about the conversation around like accessibility and affordability is being able to take risks in some way, like as a business leader, um, you know, a lot of times they always, you know, in the current capitalist system we live in, it's like, you know, it's all about profit, 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 and expanding and like having businesses be these beh behemoths, right? Yeah. Of like churning out product, 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 which in a way it's like that is part of the problem, right? And so it's like, 
I'm just wondering how have you contended with a market that is kind of the antithesis where it's like, okay, you want to make a scalable company or a company that is doing well, but then you also don't want to destroy the planet. Some people may say that those two things come into direct conflict with each other with the current economic system we're in. How have you treaded that line? You know, I think that's such an important question. And I really want to serve as an example of a business that can champion good and that can do right, can do right for the planet, for our customers, for our consumers, for our employees, still be a profitable business, that it's not diametrically opposed to one another. You know, one of the reasons I've chosen to remain privately held is that I didn't want to be driven by short-term capitalism. I didn't want to go public and have mm. to have quarterly reports and mm. have to make those quarterly reports and have to think short term versus thinking long term. I didn't want to be acquired and mm. have someone come in and gut the heart and the soul of who Ecos is. So mm. if you look at the playing field right now, right, not only are we the only woman owned and black owned brand that's nationally distributed, but we're still the only one that's privately held. Mm. You know, so many of the other brands have been bought and acquired by much larger conglomerates, right? All of our all of our competitors have been bought by conglomerates, right? Seventh Generation is now part of Unilever, Method, Mrs. Myers, Ecover is part of SC Johnson, right? So everyone is being acquired in this space. And I've held steadfast in our belief and our commitment mm. that consumers will want brands that do the right thing for the long run, that mm. they want to vote. They want to vote for their with their dollars, with brands that are aligned with their values, their beliefs. And I didn't feel like in a world where we gave up control, we could ever meet that consumer need, that planetary need. And mm -hmm. so we're here to really show up in a real way. And we hope that the consumers recognize exactly who we are at Ecos. Now, thank you for sharing that. And for people who don't know, what is the current problem with the average cleaning product? Like just from like a public health and like chemical perspective, because maybe people oh, listening to this yes. don't even realize that their cleaning products are causing harm. Can you tell people and educate oh, them on that? Thank you. My favorite question to answer, because I absolutely believe that so many people do not know. So first of all, when you go into a store and buy a cleaning product, it's important that you know there is no one who has checked that product for human health and safety. So when you think of food, when you think of other things that are sold in stores, you yeah. think of the FDA, you think of government bodies that are checking, yeah. nobody checks cleaning products. And so you what? as a cleaning product company can put anything you want in that bottle and you can sell it at that retail store. Number two, there is no requirement in the United States to even disclose the ingredients. So you can pick up a cleaning product and look at the back and you can see skulls and crossbones and you can see it says do not ingest, but you as a consumer don't even know what's in it. So it's twofold. Number one, no regulation. And number two, no transparency. And so I'm really passionate about fighting for both of those things. Mm. And at the minimum, if we're not going to have regulation, regulation that at least give transparency, at least give the consumer the right to look at the label and decide whether or not they want to bring those chemicals into their household. In 1970, when the EPA was created, they grandfathered in more than 83,000 chemicals that were never checked for human health and safety. Now over 40,000 of those chemicals are still in commerce. Many of them are in cleaning products and we're not doing anything to check them. Wow. In 2017, when Tosca reform came out, I was so excited because I said, okay, the Toxic Substances Control Act, finally we're going to check these things. They decided to check 10 a year. And when you think about 10, you're like, 10? We should check 10 a week. Like, we got to hurry up, right? Whoa. People are getting sick. And the reality is there's so many ingredients and in cleaning products that are linked to cancer, to asthma, to nerve and organ damage. And people are fighting these illnesses right now. 40% of people will have an invasive cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. Wow. That's a crazy number, 40%. It's huge. You will, you know, people will get cancer or their loved ones will get cancer. It's too high of a number. And so as we're trying to empower ourselves, look at your food. What are you eating? Look at your personal care. What are you putting on yourself? And look at your cleaning products. What are you breathing in? What toxic residues are left? The skin is the largest organ in your body. 
When you're washing your clothes with things that have really dangerous ingredients and you're putting that on your body, your skin is absorbing it quicker than what you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. You need to know. So I would say that, you know, as, as, as a rule of thumb, number one, people should understand that cleaning should not mean spreading toxins. Mm -hmm. They should understand that that's currently exactly what's happening and they have to be their own best advocates. Mm. And so by selecting a brand like ours, number one, we disclose all of our ingredients. The consumer can always read our label for transparency. Number two, we've selected to partner with the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Safer Choice Program. Mm. And this is a really great program because it is a program that is not a pay to play program. It's a government sanctioned program where the NSF comes in and they audit everything. Are you using the greenest ingredients? Are you innovating in terms of green science? Are your products efficacious? Because they need to work. If your products don't work, they're also not sustainable, right? right? So that's another critically important thing. And so they check all of those things. If your product passes, then you get the US EPA's Safer Choice certification, and you can put that right on the front of your product. So if a consumer is in a store, an easy thing they can do is look for that US EPA Safer Choice. It looks like a little house with a family, and then you know that someone has checked it, and then you know that those claims are true. That's so wild. I think sometimes people don't think that cleaning supplies or the things that you inhale even in your home from an indoor air pollution standpoint is an environmental justice issue. I think it a lot is. of people, it's a privilege to be able to be educated, to be able to know what's in your home and to have the time and the energy to even think about that, to even fathom that. So I think it's really important to figure out how to like provide that education in a really feasible and easy way and also to make it affordable to people like you said earlier on. So I think it's really great that you all have already identified that like if you have all of these barriers to entry and can't just make it easy for people um then you're going to leave large swaths of the population out of the conversation of living a cleaner more sustainable life for themselves and their family's health so i think it's really important that we educate people point blank that the things you have in your home actually contribute to your health and well-being or the opposite of that. And I think yes. understanding that you are allowed to be an educated and informed consumer is a part of you being able to protect yourselves and your families in the long term. I think that's that's so important that you emphasize that. So thank you for bringing that thank up. Thank you. So, yeah. And that, that's why I love the work that you do. I mean, I love the work you do because you're reaching out to people, you're educating people, you're giving them access to the information. And that's so very important. What you said, indoor air pollution is five to 70 times higher than outdoor air pollution. Like imagine indoor air pollution, five to 70 times higher than the outdoors because of the cleaning products that we're bringing into our homes. Mm -hmm. And this really came top of mind for me, especially in 2020 with the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly, here is a virus that attacks people's lungs. So the most important thing is to protect your lung health, to make sure your lungs are strong. And at the same time that we have a virus circulating that's attacking people's lungs, people are being told, disinfect, disinfect, kill, kill, kill. Well, when you think of a kill claim, we too are living organisms. We too are breathing those things in and we are also hurting ourselves. And so cleaning shouldn't mean kill, kill, kill. Cleaning is the act of removing mm. viruses, bacteria, and germs from surfaces. So if you actually went to the website and you actually looked at, hey, how should I protect myself? It said step one was to clean, remove these things from surfaces. Step two was to disinfect if you were in hospitals, heavily trafficked areas like schools and things, but it should not be used like that in an ongoing basis because you're just creating a really toxic environment and our bodies can't survive that. You know, people understand a little more now about probiotics and good right. bacteria. People are taking now supplements to replenish right. the good bacteria in their guts. And then they're killing all the bacteria in their home biome. And right. so we have to really make sure that we think of the home. It's 
it's part of who we are. And the other thing is that people are inside now more than ever before. I went to a conference where they coined a term nature deficit disorder, mm -hmm. and they said that children are getting less time outside than mm -hmm. prisoners. Prisoners are mandated one hour outside. Children are not on average getting an hour outside. Whoa. They're in their homes, they're on their electronics, they're in schools, and they're breathing in these things all day long. Wow. And it's like, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, I've walked into a lot of places that are quote unquote clean, like, and it's, you know, it's great. Like it looks very clean, it's very shiny, but it's like, but you breathe it in and your like nose hurts and you get a headache and you're like, but people are like, you know, especially grow up in like a brown household, it's like, well, those are the products that work the best. So it's like the idea of like, there's this idea that like, if something is more sustainable or eco-friendly, it's not going to work as well. So, you know, you were talking about the efficacy of the product, I think, how have you all been able to continue refining the product to make sure that it is as competitive as, you know, the Lysols or whatever in the world, you know, where it's like people are like, well, that's the name brand. And like everyone uses that, even though maybe that's not the best for my body. But hey, it's going to get the job done. How have you all like combated that with the mm. products you've made? Absolutely. There's efficacy is critically important. If the product doesn't work, it's not sustainable. So for us, constantly innovating, breaking barriers in green science. Green science has come a long way yeah. over the last 50 years, right? And so right now, today, I can show you third-party testing that shows that our ECOS with enzymes works just as well as any conventional laundry detergent, right? Mm. And so we have to get people to shift their thinking from the idea that green doesn't work to the fact that it absolutely works today. And that people that are brand loyal to brands of their parents and their grandparents, yes. our parents and our grandparents, they didn't have the information. They didn't mm. know. And so as we become, we have more access to information now than ever before. People are walking around with cell phones in their hands. They're Googling it. They're searching it. We know. And so oftentimes yeah. we have the opportunity to do better, to be better yeah. because our parents didn't know. When World War II finished and they had all this bleach that they were using for chemical warfare, yeah. they're like, oh, what should we do with this? Oh, dump it into the consumer products good space and tell people we'll just use it to whiten their white clothes. So a product that was used for chemical warfare is now used when your kid plays soccer and gets a grass stain. Like that should not be the case yeah. for sure. Bleach has a role in a hospital setting with a blood spill, absolutely. As an everyday item in your home, no. I'm watching people wash their bathtubs with bleach and then they sit in it, they soak in it, they absorb it through their pores and it's so <laughs> harmful to human health. And you know, these are things that we absolutely have to get away from and educating our community to know, hey, listen, I know you grew up with this item and I, I know. know when you smell it because smell is such an right. important thing too. Smell is the closest thing tied to memory. People smell mm -hmm. things and they're like, oh, smells like grandma, smells like mom it smells like we have to now understand smells like cancer smells like danger you know and we shouldn't be fooled by these harsh synthetic right. fragrances into feeling like oh that lemon smell is somehow healthy and fresh no it's toxic if a product says skulls and crossbones on it it is not <laughs> the lemon scent you want in your home it's so true. I mean, obviously this isn't like a cleaning product, but even when I go into like cars that have like really strong air fresheners, I'm like, this really isn't making your car better. Like this is giving me a headache. Like I don't want this. You know what I mean? I'm very sensitive to smell, honestly, myself, like very sensitive. Like I am my, my, I actually learn more about sensitivity because my mom actually tends to get skin rashes from the wrong, like, like skincare products. So my mom only yes. uses like, gentle products so like that was actually interesting growing up because my mom had sensitive skin so she didn't really have a choice she would break out in her rashes otherwise so I guess I'm really lucky that like also growing up in like an Asian household care a lot about taking care of our skin in some ways so at least when it came to like skin care it was very much like let's think about what we're putting on the body mostly because otherwise we're gonna break out into rashes but I don't think that honestly got translated as much into the products like you know my family sometimes still uses Windex and uses Lysol and uses all these things and I tell them I'm like that is so bad for you like that is not good yes. for your like your brain and your like breathing and all these things but you know it's one of those things where they're like well this is what's effective and I'm just like 
but they're getting better. Like my mom the other day, like she always messages me, like she'll send me pictures and it's like, is this a good product? Is this good? Is this good? So it's good. Like I've become that vetting system. But again, it's like one of those things where I understand for a consumer, like that can feel really stressful where you're like, well, everything's bad. Everything causes cancer. So then you like end up on the opposite end where it's like, well, everything's going to kill me, so I don't really care. So then there's also that. And so it's like we also have to hone in and be like, yes, it's overwhelming. Yes, it's anxiety-inducing. But, you know, maybe this is the short list of vetted brands that, like, I believe in, you know, and, like, let's make it easy for people. So that's where the consumer advocacy and education is really important to where it's like, you know, this product has already been tested. It already has these things. This is why. And this is why you should educate yourself about it. So I'm wondering, like, what other things does Ecos do from, like, an educational standpoint for, like, consumers? Yeah. So we do a lot of different programs here. So one of the things I'm here in California right now, we partner with museums in our local cool. areas. So here we partner with the Discovery Science Center. There's one in Santa Ana. There's another one in Los Angeles. Cool. If you go into the Discovery Science Center with your kids, you get a shopping cart and you walk up and down the aisles and you'll <laughs> see our Ecos products and it'll ask the kids, what should you look for when you read a label? Plant powered, mm. biodegradable, what are the things? And there's a game for kids under six and there's a game for kids over six. I love that. And they play that game and if they win the game, they get a coin. We also <laughs> partner with the museum to go into fifth grade classrooms of public schools and have an eco science program yeah. so that we would teach these fifth graders, look at the power of nature. And we would show them, how do you make a green product? Number one, you need a surfactant. What is a surfactant? It's a cleaning <laughs> agent. It can come from coconut. It can come from potato waste. Then we add enzymes. Then we add essential oils. Where do they come from? They come from lavender fields. And we show them how we meet with the farmers that grow the lavender, how we follow the lavender through the steam distillation process. And we have the children make the products. Wow. And then at the end, the child gets to take that home to mom or dad and to speak about yeah. it. And they made it themselves. We also partner with a lot of local community organizations. This month for Earth Month, we just had sticks here watts sticks here to do a big kickoff for earth month with him because we partnered with him he has a think watts foundation in los angeles and it was unbelievable because we were at an event and he was talking about the fact that the second leading cause why children were missing school in los angeles was because they didn't have clean clothes and that was so shocking to me and so we partnered with the austin eckler foundation and you probably know him los angeles chargers running back and his foundation put in washing machines and dryers in schools we donated all the laundry detergent so that when kids came to school rather than their teachers taking their clothes home to wash it they could wash them on site wow. they could give them to the kids on site but they could also educate them about why they should use safer cleaning products cool. showing up at community events being active in our communities working with people like you to really get the message out. I mean, we're trying to think, how do we meet children? Where do we meet the teens? Where do we meet the new mom? Pregnancy is oftentimes the gateway to green. The first time someone <laughs> is thinking about- Pregnancy is the gateway to green. Yes. That's a good tagline, that's how Yes, funny. it's true because you're like thinking about your unborn child and you're wondering about what do all of these things have? You know, when a baby is born right now, there's 200 chemicals coursing through their body that they're exposed to in utero because of the products we're putting on us. Whoa. You talked about your mom having sensitive skin, right? You know, and her skin, you know, the beauty of sensitive skin is your skin immediately is telling you, right. hey, something's wrong with this product. So many people have developed you know, a resistance to all of these things and their bodies aren't even reacting anymore, right? So and they're just scary. taking it. But in the end, they end up with cancer and all these illnesses, right? right. And so, you know, your mom was telling her right away, like these things are dangerous, right? right? And I think that pregnancy is a time that people are really thinking about their unborn child yeah. or the child they're about to bring home. But, you know, we try and meet them where they are. Yeah. Social media is a wonderful democratizing platform where yeah. you can publish a lot of educational content. If you go to ecos.com, our website, you'll see we list all of the nasties and these nasties, <laughs> There are 500 chemicals you find in cleaning products. We wow. want to make it easy because we understand it's overwhelming and we don't want people to just shut down and go, you know, forget it. I don't care. We want to yeah. just say, hey, it's easy. Let's just look for the safer cool. choice designation. You want to cheat, cheat, look at this list. Cool. 
No, that's really helpful. I mean, I'm definitely going to check that out. That's awesome. And, you know, as someone who identifies as being African-American and also Greek, how do you feel your identity has informed your leadership and your work at Ecos? Like, how is that, how has your culture yes. made this so important to you as your mission? Oh, well, you know, I have drawn so much inspiration from my cultural background. I think all our ancestral legacies can inspire us in really powerful ways when we tap into them. So I'll talk first about the Greek side, simply because our company was first started by my father, who was a Greek immigrant. Mm. And so my father came to this country in the 1950s. He had grown up on the island of Crete in Greece. He grew up during Nazi-occupied Greece. He lost his father in the concentration camps. It was a very difficult time. He lived through the Civil War, and when he was 18, he hid on a ship, came to this country, didn't speak the English language, lived in homeless shelters, has just an amazing backstory. And then he started studying chemistry at Roosevelt University when he was young because of the Greek root words, and he went on to become a chemist. And as a chemist, he was wondering why were we working with so many dangerous ingredients that were so harmful. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, Rachel Carson had written the book Silent Spring about mm -hmm. the dangers of DDT. He read that, and he was thinking about growing up in Greece, how his mother had used lemon and vinegar mm -hmm. and all these natural ingredients, and was thinking, why don't we do that? And so mm -hmm. started our company in his garage in 1967. Wow. I joined him in 2003, 20 years ago, full-time and then he passed away 10 years ago when I took over the company wow. but you know it's an amazing vision and mission he had because certainly in the 60s nobody was talking about green cleaning and he was no. really inspired by nature and I had the beautiful opportunity to spend a lot of time with my father in Greece spending time swimming in the ocean wow. seeing the beautiful marine life being in nature with him you know as a young boy with no money growing up during the war nature Nature was his excitement. Nature was his gift. It was free. It was accessible. He could get in the water. He could climb in the forest. And he never forgot that joy and that love. And that's something that I've always really cherished and taken from him. Now, I grew up with my mom, an amazing woman. I just was so blessed to have such a wonderful mom. She also had a very challenging backstory, very much like my father. She grew up in 12 different foster homes wow. and had a very hard start. Yet if you had met my mother, you would have thought she grew up in a house that had a picket fence and an intact family because she's the true example of someone who saw all of the things that she didn't want for her child mm -hmm. and then became the person that she always envisioned she would have in her life yeah. and she grew me up she she raised me to really have a lot of strength and courage and bravery mm -hmm. she faced a lot of injustice throughout her life and she really raised me to look to always create a more mm -hmm. equitable and a more just world and so in my early years I went to UCLA and I was in love with African-American art I took 10 different courses at UCLA because I loved black art as a means to both tell our story but it was always a, a really wonderful way to to have a form of political and social protest mm -hmm. and art was so powerful my my first job when I graduated from UCLA was curating an exhibition at the California African American Museum. And I actually met my husband when I was there. He wow. has, yeah, yeah, he has an African American art gallery that he's had for now over 40 years. And it's an amazing space. And it was just so important at that time for me to figure out how do we use art as a peaceful weapon? And how do we use art to really create the world that we want? How do we have a vision? How do we create something really beautiful? When I ended up joining the family business in 2003, that same feeling and focus was so passionate in me. And now I entered a space where we have a product that's committed to protecting people, pets, and the planet. That's who we are. That's what we do. And if our mission is to truly protect people, pets, and the planet, then 
social justice and environmental justice must be part of that mission mm. because we're not protecting people in our planet if we're not looking at that as well. Mm. And so I would say, you know, both of my backgrounds were, were deeply informative of the leader that I am today. You know, I'm really proud of our business it's not just woman owned 60 percent of our leadership is comprised of women 45 percent of our leadership is bipoc wow. and it's important it's so important to build a diverse team if you're going to serve a diverse consumer because the reality is is that if you don't have someone at the decision making table from a diverse background, then you are not hearing that perspective, then you will never satisfy the need of that consumer. And I think companies have to really focus on that because the evidence is overwhelming. We know now that companies financially perform better when more women and diverse leaders are at the table. Mm -hmm. People should heed that. It's important for the long-term success of their businesses. That's really amazing that you all don't just say, oh, it's important to talk about diversity and inclusion. It's actually embedded in your leadership because I see that time and time again, companies being like, well, it's great, it's important, but ultimately like you see the leadership and you know, you go up the pyramid and the, the melanin continues to decrease the higher up you go, right? So right, I think that's, right. that's, yeah. And you see the, the female component also decrease the higher you go up. Yes. So, I think that's amazing that you all were like, you know what? No, like we are going to have a woman of color at the top. Yeah. And we are and going we're gonna to have, talk about and, and we other also, people in the future do that too. Yeah, exactly. That's right. I mean, 70% of my technical team, so that would be chemists, that would be research and development, are comprised of women. Women have long been underrepresented in STEM and in the sciences, you know, and it's so important to have. We're making products that women are using every day. I want to make sure that we have female creators and female mm -hmm. innovators thinking about their perspective when they're ideating, when they're creating their moonshots, when they're coming up with innovation. That's another area that I'm really passionate about, more women in STEM. I love that. And, you know, I feel like a lot of the work that Ecos has done has been pretty OG, but I think it, like, has influenced, you know, some of the culture shift around how companies are thinking about being green and being sustainable because we're seeing more and more of that popping up. But there's also still companies that are just catching up, right? They're catching up to the line. They're now having conversations around sustainable packaging and actually thinking about what's going into their products just now, right? Better late than never, but still, people are trying to yeah. get on it. What is some of your advice to those business leaders? Why do we need more business leaders to step up this day and age when it comes to climate change and sustainability to really walk the walk? What is your advice to them? So I'll say a couple things about that. First of all, businesses must act. We are facing the greatest existential crisis and we cannot rely just on government or just on individuals. Government and individuals are critically important, but businesses have a huge role to play. And I promise you, you know, climate change is not good for business. We now are impacted by so many severe weather patterns. It's so disruptive to business, right? So if people are not thinking of the law long term, their businesses are going to suffer if they don't shift their mindset. We no longer have the ability to say, oh, you know what, that's just not a priority right now, or that doesn't fit the budget line right now. If we do not address it and address it in a very, very comprehensive way, it'll be an overwhelming crisis to face. Mm -hmm. And so I think as businesses, number one, they need to look at things over the long run. Mm -hmm. When I put solar panels on all of our manufacturing facilities, Facilities, it was a significant investment at the time, no doubt. But now I have the free, limitless power of the sun, right? <laughs> so don't look at just that quarter that you invested in those panels. Look at where you will be. As we need more and more energy to produce, I'm harnessing it from the sun. The sun is up there and it's free. So over time, yes, the investment up front might be significant, but over time you will save money. A lot of these sustainability initiatives will actually 
help your bottom line. And people aren't thinking about that. Reducing packaging reduces costs. Taking mm -hmm. out things, reusing things, repurposing things reduces costs. I remember in 2014 when we took our minimum wage to $17 an hour. And this is going back, you know, almost 10 years. And, you know, now they're talking about $15 an hour. But 10 years ago, we were saying $17 an hour, oh. $17 an hour. And we were saying that because we were looking at the cost of living and we did not believe that the minimum wage at that time the minimum wage was seven dollars and 25 cents and we were saying no people cannot survive 17 dollars has to be the minimum wage mm -hmm. and i remember at that time you know different shows i was on fox and other places and they were like so 17 dollars an hour and then the green screen would run like how many jobs will be lost and all of these different things but what people are are missing there are so many costs in a business if you don't take care of your team you have recruiting costs, hiring costs, training costs, you know, a lack of commitment. You have mm -hmm. issues with company culture. You have people that won't stop the production line and raise their hand because they don't care about the product they're making. When you invest in your people, when you take care of your team members, they will take care of you in return. Yeah. You'll have a retention of corporate memory. You'll have a passionate team of mm -hmm. people who care about their work. Mm -hmm. And so when people were saying that, oh yeah, seven dollars and 25 cents and you're constantly replacing those people and you're constantly having turnover and you're constantly retaining like you're not thinking about so I would say to business leaders who are, are just entering this space in the sustainability space that even if bottom line profits are your focus these initiatives over the long run will address that need and mm -hmm. and also Consumers are now demanding it. If you want to be a relevant company for the future, you better address the needs that your consumers have. Mm -hmm. And the need to protect the health of themselves and their loved ones is so great. You know, you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You know, what are the things that are most important? Food, shelter, all of these things, right? Health, health is critically important. We all understand without our health, we have nothing. We have to stop making products that hurt human and planetary health. Those things will become companies of the past. Mm. Ooh, fire, that's true. Yeah, it's like either step up or get left or behind. Or step aside, yes. Or step aside, yeah, I love yes. that, I love that. Because there's and, many, there's yep. many of us out there that want to do the right thing. So yep. we would like to take that spot. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. So, you know, to wrap us up here, you have made big strides. You've taken risks. You've held strong on being, you know, a privately held company, not doing the status quo thing that a lot of companies are doing, even in the green and sustainability space. That takes risk. Like, I know that you humble yourself, you're a little... You're like playing it cool, but like that's pretty cool. That's pretty dope. Like that's amazing. Like that's like not easy to do that, you know? Mm. And so I'm just wondering, like, what is your advice, especially to other women of color who maybe have their own innovative idea on how they want to come up with a solution and change the world, but they just don't have the support system? May you know, not all of us were born to amazing Greek fathers that have lemon and vinegar and have all these yeah. beautiful visions yeah, of the world, absolutely. right? And so I'm just wondering, like, you obviously have been a mentor to so many and an inspiration to a lot of people. But I just want to know, like, for those of us that maybe didn't have that and don't necessarily have the blueprint or the roadmap on where to begin, what is your advice to us? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a, that's a great question because, you know, I would say first and foremost, understand who you are and what you want out of life. And I think that's very important because it is hard. There's no doubt that it is hard. And having a purpose-filled life will be something that will propel you during the darkest moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly you can imagine, you know, there's many dark moments in any business. And if you have a strong conviction and a strong center and a strong core and you know what you want and you know where you want to go, that'll be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Number two, do find mentors. That's important. 
who are the people in your community? Who are the people that inspire you? Oftentimes, it's not going to be a parent. Oftentimes, it's not going to be a family member. Oftentimes, it's going to be somebody that you met at that event, that you saw at that community thing, that teacher that was in the classroom, that person that was a friend of someone you knew, right? And so finding your people and surrounding yourself with like-minded people because it's really important to have a posse of people that are going where you want to go. I always say that to my daughter, right? My daughter who's 18 years old, I always want her to have friends that are aspirational to her, friends that she can look up to, friends that inspire her to want to do more, to want to be better, to want to work harder. Make sure that as you create the circle of people around you, you don't create a circle of people that drag you down. It is important to lift others up. I'm not saying it's not. And I think Michelle Obama had one of the greatest quotes when she said, you need three friends in life. You need one behind you that you lift up. You need one next to you that you walk alongside. And then you need one in front of you that you inspire to, right? Mm. So the circle you put around you is critically important. Mm. Education is important. And so make sure that you do everything you can to have the education so that you can level the playing field. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, I would encourage young people, there's so many grants, there's so many scholarships, there's so many things out there, look for them, find them, find that way. I am so sorry that the education system here in the United States is so expensive. Yeah. It's unbelievable that that's the case. But you really wanna see what are the ways in which you can find community to support you. Look for all of those opportunities because education helps level the playing field. It gives you the ability to see the world differently. It gives you the ability to think differently. And if you have grown up in an environment that might have lacked those opportunities, how can you put yourself in an educational space where you're surrounded by people that are doing all these things and thinking and creating and innovating. And then I would just say, you know, prioritize your health always in your life. Think about your health first and foremost, and that is sleep, and that is exercise, and that is the foods you put into your body, and those are the cleaning products you surround yourself <laughs> with. Ensure that you're physically healthy. Address mental health. Mental health, we're currently facing a crisis of unprecedented proportions, especially with our young people. Do not ignore that. Brain health is mental health, and so, the foods, the products, all of these things affect the health of our brains. The brain is an important organ in your body. So make sure that you're addressing brain health, that you're addressing mental health. All of these are gonna be critical in your own personal journey to success. And then just understand that there's a lot of people rooting for you. In days that feel overwhelming and challenging, where you feel like there's no one on your side, just, you know, do not allow those automatic negative thoughts yeah. to derail you. We all have what you know people refer to as ants. There's a wonderful psychiatrist, Dr. Amen, who talks about ants, automatic negative thoughts. Do not allow those to control you. Yeah. And do not allow who you were to define who you will be. You mm -hmm. know, I mentioned my mom because she's the primary example of somebody and my father, both of them, you know, my father in homeless shelters, my mother who grew up in 12 different foster homes. Neither one of them allowed those very challenging beginnings to define who they would be. They created a mission and a vision for their lives. And I would encourage people to do the exact same thing because, you know, oftentimes we don't have the opportunity to decide things that happened to us in the past, but we most certainly are always the decision makers of our futures. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was really helpful, and I'm sure it'll inspire lots of people listening. Hi. So how can people stay in touch with Ecos and learn about what you all are up to these days? Absolutely. Well, I hope you'll follow us if you're on Instagram. Our handle on Instagram is at Ecos Cleans. That's E-C-O-S Cleans. Mm -hmm. uh, I, too, am on Instagram at Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, 
from ECOS, mm -hmm. E-C-O-S. You can go online to ecos.com and see what we're up to. We've got a blog always running there with all sorts of information. And we're just really proud to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for creating an audience that, you know, is really interested in what they can do to protect our beautiful shared planet. Thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate having you on today. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of the Brown Girl Green podcast. You can listen to the Brown Girl Green podcast, this episode and others, wherever you get your shows. Make sure you subscribe to the Brown Girl Green YouTube channel and follow the new Brown Girl Green podcast Instagram at Brown Girl Green podcast. Thank you all so much for listening in, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.